and I've got the the syllabus up. The only reason I put the syllabus up was just to to run down to the uh, schedule. Yeah. Well, I want to stop here too. Grading. Uh, no, there are no quizzes in this grading schedule. Okay. I've got um, six exams and labs and attendance, and then of course the homework is extra credit again. Yeah. Have you tried to go in and be sure you can get into it? I tried, but it, it's acting crazy. I thought I'd try it again today. Okay. What did you have to do to get into it last time? I just bought the course and put in the number. But this time, it, it's like won't even let me log in for some reason. No, I mean, the, uh, at, toward the end of last term, you oh, were having trouble. I turned my computer on and off. Oh. I mean, I don't, I don't know what was up with it. Okay. I thought it was, so I just turned it on and off. Yeah, you shouldn't have to to buy it again yeah um maybe contact tech support yeah i need to you. well i finally got logged in just a second ago i was on the wrong thing it's still wanting to show like these ones so i guess i need to put in a different number oh yeah i set up a different uh course yeah i don't know how to do that though um, how to put that in you know um let's see because it's the same book isn't it yeah same book it's yeah. a different student set id um, let's see. Get yourself to student set. Do that. Okay, there we go. There you go. Here's your student set. Okay. Okay. okay there good. it is. All right. Just you know, take a little while to get it. there. Oh, now you have to pick. Yeah. Okay. Chapter nine. Okay. That's the only one I've set up so far. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right, we're on the same track, then. All right, so in the um, schedule I've set up, I hope it's doable. The um, Today, we're going to cover Chapter 9 only, and that'll be the uh, chapter for a first exam. Okay. The reason I did that was because it's got a lot, a lot of information in here that uh, it may take you a few minutes to get up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to compare the competition between SN2, 1, E2, and 1, and see which one is favored under what conditions. Right. And that's, uh, and I, the only reason I laid out your stuff over here, since there's only one of you, is just to be sure I had everything I, I supposed oh, to yeah. have brought with me. So all that is yours. Yeah. Okay. I even put two of the labs in there that I had ready. Mm -hmm. And there's one lab uh, down here, this liquid liquid extraction. I don't have that one set up yet. But hopefully next week we will uh, make aspirin. That's cool. We use um, salicylic acid and um, uh, acetic anhydride are the two reactants. And Do you ever it's... make that at home to take it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, just make it in the lab. Yeah. I mean, it's too cheap to try to, yeah. to make it at home. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know if like, you ever got a pension, like had to make it at home to take it. Oh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I wouldn't trust myself to have a pure enough. Yeah. Now, the procedure itself goes through a recrystallization process like we did on that other. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> um, we're going to uh, purify it and hopefully we'll be able to test it for purity with an iron compound. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's for today. We're just doing chapter nine. Next week, we're just going to do chapter ten. Have a short exam. The exam's not that, not that long. Um, and uh, and then hopefully we'll get in the lab. All right, that's all I had to to talk about this. I'm going to stop that share and share the powerpoints. The other reason I'm only covering chapter nine today is there are almost a hundred slides in this set. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot to take in too. Hopefully that we won't we won't have to drill dwell very long on each slide, yeah. but um Do I need to sign the No. Okay, since so it's just me at it. Yeah, just you. I if I can't remember one student, I'm in pretty bad shape. I might as well run for president. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I need, uh, let's see, make a slideshow. <clears throat>
<laughs> there we go. All right. We got the uh, <clears throat> we got the air on. I got a fan blowing, push it back this way because yeah. it was pretty toasty in here this morning. It feels good now. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, chapter nine. Um, these four reactions, they're not all of the reactions that can, uh, that we've studied, but they're, uh, I guess you call them go-to reactions when, uh, an organic chemist is looking into, uh, well, creating a mechanism or creating a synthesis plan, um, these are four that we go to and we need to know under what circumstances is one preferred over the other because you can put two reactants together and if you change the conditions you can get a different product and this is one of those times all right so just as a review uh remember the the two stands for molecularity the one stands for molecularity so one means Unimolecular, two means bimolecular. So that means uh, SN2 and E2 happen in one step with two reactants coming together. Uh, and the, the SN1 and the E1 occur in two steps with only one reactant in each elementary step. And the um, intermediate for the SN1 E1 is a carbocation. So we look at carbocations in detail because their stability determines uh, how fast the reaction will go or if it will go. Um, there's a distinction between um, nucleophiles and bases. Now they're very similar. Nucleophiles, they go for uh, electron deficient carbons usually. Uh, and bases go for hydrogens. Uh, they try to bond with hydrogens. So they're more, they, they're associated with the um, E2 and E1 reactions or, or with proton transfers. Um, while the uh, SN2 and SN1 are uh, involved with nucleophilic attack on a carbon itself. Okay, um, these two terms will be used often in, uh, in this discussion from, from here on out. Unfeasible is unlikely to occur. Doesn't mean it doesn't occur, but it's a... Um, it's part of a decision-making process where you say it's unfeasible, so I'm going to look for something else. Or feasible says it may occur, but it doesn't say anything about the relative rates. Right? It it might be feasible, but it could could occur at a slow rate. Uh, feasible generally is used in terms of uh, competition. Right? If these, if out of those four types of reactions, only two are feasible then that means they could both occur, but then you have you need a tiebreaker. And we'll get to that also. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, here's an example of an uh, SN2 reaction uh, where uh, the acetate ion is the attacking, it's the nucleophile. So we generally put the, the attacking species on the on the yields arrow. And these two come together. It attacks that carbon with the bromine on it because the bromine is a good leaving group. And we end up with um, the, can you see it that far away? Yeah. Okay. A little bit. We end up with that right hand species where the acetate it replaces the bromine. And notice that the bromine is, is uh, facing toward us, right? it has a wedge, but the acetate has the dash because it has to use a backside attack because the 
uh, acetate ion is too big to come in from the front. So that's another another issue that we deal with in this chapter uh, stereochemistry. Okay, that's the SN2. If we use an SN1 mechanism, then the bromine leaves first and creates a carbocation. And then the nucleophile attacks that uh, deficient carbon. That's the uh, second step over from the left on the bottom. And when it does that, it forms a bond. But since the carbocation is not hindered from front or back, we get enantiomers. Uh, well, actually, if you've got more than one, actually, those are diastereomers. Because the, uh, the methyl groups are still pointing out, but the other two groups are forwards and backwards. So they're not mirror images of each other. Those are those two possible products of diastereomers. Okay, those are two possible mechanisms for a similar outcome. But since the major product on the SN2 is just that one isomer, that's that's one way we can experimentally determine which one is preferred. I mean, we, we've got some rules that we're going to use to try to predict, but ultimately the the referee in this whole operation is what's the outcome? I mean, what do you get in the lab? And if you get these um, uh, a racemic mixture of these two isomers, then you're pretty sure that that reaction occurred by SN1, not SN2. Okay, compare the E2 to the E1 with um, actually it's the same substrate. And now, instead of attacking the carbon, the acetate ion attacks the hydrogen that's just opposite the leaving group. Remember, we, that, we ended on that note in Chapter 8, I think, yeah. where, you had the, where we used the Newman projection and you saw that they were opposite one another. Um, anti. Anti is the correct word. They were anti. The bromine was anti to the hydrogen. So in that case then the nucleophile actually in this case the acetate ion is not behaving as a nucleophile it's behaving as a base it's attacking the hydrogen so when it bonds with the hydrogen the electrons that were <laughs> bonding the hydrogen to the carbon are now transferred between the two carbons we form a pi bond and that that forces the carbon attached to the bromine to exceed its octet, so the bromine has to leave. Okay, that's an E2 reaction, and we end up with, in E2s and E1s, we end up with the pi bond. <clears throat> okay, so what would happen in an E1 reaction? Uh, similarly, the, the bromine leaves first. So actually, um, we're going to get into a little more detail, but I would make this point. Um, deciding between an E2 and an E1 or an SN2 and an SN1 has a lot to do with how good is your leaving group. The better the leaving group, the more likely it is to be a 1 rather than a 2. But there are other conditions involved, and we're going to go through those one at a time. Okay, so... Um, if the bromine leaves first, then we produce another carbocation. And now the, um, the acetate ion acts as a base, it attacks the hydrogen, and it forms um, a mixture of isomers. In one case, the uh, methyl group is on the same side as the phenyl group, so it'd be uh, Z isomer, and in another case, the methyl group is on the opposite side, be the E isomer. So there again, you get you get two uh, diastereomers out of the E1, just like we did with the SN1, because of that carbocation intermediate. All right. Just a reminder, rate-determining steps for SN2 
there's only one step. So that's the rate determining step, right? If we use a, a generic nucleophile attacking uh, a carbon skeleton with a leaving group on it, uh, then that's the outcome. We get the, that product. Uh, if the rate determining step for uh, S SN1 would be the first step for the leaving group. That's the slow step, always. All right. Uh, similarly, for E2 versus E1, right? we only have one step in the E2, so that's the rate determining step. Uh, it's Actually, it's an elementary uh, reaction mechanism. The SN2 and the E2 are both elementaries because there's only one transition state. But the, the SN1 and the SN2, uh, excuse me, SN1 and E1 are uh, multi-step. And the slow step is the first one. Okay, that was just a reminder. Now, um, since we're going to have to deal with um, these factors, there are six factors that we, we have to consider, and they're in order of importance. Right? The most important factor is the strength of the attacking species, whether it's considered a nucleophile or a base. How strong is it as it's, uh, will it be a nucleophile for the SN2 uh, or SN1 choice between the two? So the strength here list these in order and one thing you'll notice is that the nucleophiles first of all they all have lone pairs of electrons water of course is is the uh, is the zero point these are relative to one another right water has those lone pairs but um the strength of the attacking group also determines is determined by Electronegativities, uh, like in the next one, the uh, uh, pyridine, or you get this group, that groups. I got to substitute in the end. It's got double those, bonds. Yes, the double bonds. So that we're going to study later, but that's probably aromatic. You stick that at the back of your head, keep it safe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the rest of them all have negative charges. The negative charge adds to the strength of the attacking species, the nucleophile. Um, I would draw your attention to the difference between bromine and chlorine. Like bromine, chlorine. Chlorine is a stronger attacking species than bromine. Primarily because, well, they've got their octets, which makes them a uh, negative charge, a formal charge. But chlorine is a smaller atom, which concentrates the charge into a smaller space, and makes it stronger. That's, that's the difference there. Um, the next one, N3 minus, is um, uh, the azide ion. And then I forget the name. I wrote the names down in some of these, but I can't remember where they are. No, never mind. Um, and the strongest one there is the uh, cyanide anion. That is the strongest attacking species of that group. So what does that actually mean? When you talk about the attacking species strength, when it attacks for um, an SN2 reaction, when it attacks that carbon, uh, carbon is attached to some leaving group and something else. When it attacks, uh, let's see, probably need a hydrogen down there. When it attacks that carbon, um, and tries to form a bond with it, it is more likely to force an excess of an octet. 
when it forms, when it tries to form that bond like this one. Tries to form that bond, it forces the octet more strongly than any uh, excess octet, more strongly than others. And that makes this one, uh, let's see, those, those two right there are going to go here, and this one goes here, and that one leaves. So the stronger the attacking species, the more likely you are to have an SN2 reaction. That's the whole point of this thing. Um, this is the Hammond postulate, but I, I don't. I think this is the first we've seen the the Hammond postulate for two elementary steps that um, that are the same type. The one with the more negative value of delta G tends to have the smaller energy barrier and tends to be faster. Um, yeah, right. We know from general chemistry that delta G equals delta H plus T delta S. And if this is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. The more negative it is, the faster it goes. So if we have a, um, an exergonic reaction with a small um, uh, activation energy, then the reaction is going to go faster. Whereas if we try to go the other direction, the delta G is going to be positive. And thermodynamically, it's not favored. All right. Uh, let's see. So here we have a comparison of um, methyl iodide. <laughs> iodine then is the leaving group. The iodide ion is the leaving group. And um, let's see, we're still talking about... I'm going to pull up my uh, hard copy so I can stay on track. Here we go. Uh, yeah, okay. Iodide is the leaving group. And uh, remember, the more diffuse, the more you could spread electrons out over a larger area, the more stable it is. So, so the stability here goes from, let's see, this is less stable than that one, and this is less stable than that one. So iodine is more stable, and the stability of the leaving group is a condition that gives you a good leaving group. The more stable the species when it leaves, the better it is as a leaving group. So in this case, iodide is a good leaving group compared to chlorine, which is the attacking species. And for an SN2 reaction, if this is going to occur in one step, you should end up with um, uh, methyl chloride or methyl bromide, in whichever case it may be. Now, what we see in actuality is that the methyl bromide has the uh, larger energy barrier. Okay? Um, I would call your attention to what is the starting energy for the reactants, right? The bromide and the chloride, the, the methyl iodide is the same energy level, right? So the difference between those two energy levels is the difference between chloride and bromide. The bromide is a lower energy state because it's more stable, right? It's more stable than chloride, right? So you have a higher energy state with the chloride involved and that puts it closer to the activation energy. So the difference between its starting energy and the activated state is smaller. The, the red curve. So it takes less energy to get to that transition state. Even though the transition state's at higher energy, it didn't have to go as far to get there. And then they both end up in uh, similar uh, product energies. They're not... A, it shows them that they're the same, but I think that they're slightly different, but they're very close. We're just trying to make a point here, I think. 
So that energy barrier is in the transition state is what we're trying to overcome. And that feeds into the strength of the attacking species. Okay. Uh, if we're going to take a look at the SN1 reaction and attacking species, uh, remember that for an SN1 reaction, you get the leading group is gone first and you get the carbocation. So the rate of the reaction is determined by that first step. How fast does the, the leaving group leave? And the strength of the attacking species has nothing to do with the reaction rate. It's, it's only how fast does that leaving group leave? <clears throat> the attacking species, which is our, uh, uh, is our number one condition, the strength of the attacking species. So if the attacking species has no effect, that's one way we can tell the difference between SN2 or SN1 as we, we change up the attacking species and see if it changes the rate. So the SN1 reaction is independent of the strength of the nucleophile. So here's our, here's our rule of thumb. Strong nucleophiles tend to favor SN2 reactions because they, they force the leaving group to leave. Whereas weak nucleophiles tend to favor SN1 reaction because the nucle the leaving group is going to leave anyway. Okay. Um, I thought there was another condition. Weak nucleophiles tend to favor, actually, strong nucleophiles that are very dilute will also favor an SN1. Simply because there are fewer encounters. <laughs> you didn't have to work first this morning, did you? No, no. I, I don't know why I'm not on so much today or this morning. Must be the weather. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a list of um, uh, nucleophile strength. In addition to the ones we did before, this is a more complete list. And we find that... Um, the stability of the negative charge, the strong nucleophiles we find are all negatively charged. And anything, now they're saying all of these are strong nucleophiles. Um, I guess, I guess we could take that with a grain of salt because later we're gonna compare um, actually, later on, I think we compare hydroxide ion as the breaking point, but I believe that's for bases. So the nucleophiles, they're all charged. If you've got a charged nucleophile, uh, you can consider it strong. And uncharged are weak. So this is saying H2 is the weakest and R is the strongest? And R minus, yeah. If you have a, uh, um, a a carbon with a negative charge, a carboanion is a very strong nucleophile. And I guess RS neg and um, RCO2 neg is equal in strength? Is uh, that what that means? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. So what that tells me is um, if we're comparing those two, what would they look like? It says they're approximately. We would have some some carbon chain out here, uh, whatever it happens to be, and then the S with a minus charge. Uh, in that case, we have a complete octet there, so it's got lots of lone pairs. And then compare that to this one. Right? Uh, yeah. This carbon... O2 means it's probably like that and like that. And this one would be. So that's the carboxylic acid end. That's what that is, RCO2 minus. It's a carboxylic acid, like the acetate that we saw in the very first slides. 
same thing. Only with the acetate, this is the methyl group. And those are supposedly similar in strength. Um, let's see. Okay, here's your carbanion. These carbanions possess a, a, a lone pair of electrons. So the carbon is has its octet, but it's not bound to, to uh, four groups. It's only bound to three, so it has that lone pair available. It's a very strong nucleophile. Now, how do we form carbon ions? Um, remember, the strong nucleophiles are very unstable. So typically, if you're going to run a synthesis with a carbon ion, you have to form it in the mixture or right before you put them together because they're very unstable. The simplest way to, to generate a carbon ion is to deprotonate the carbon. So if alkanes have a pKa value around 50, right? so they're not very good acids, that hydrogen doesn't want to leave on its own. Um, the deprotonation is unfeasible for alkanes because an alkane, remember alkane is like this. There are no double bonds with other carbons. <clears throat> so we have to go to um, uh, groups that have uh, a greater intrinsic electronegativity, and that means pi bonds. Pi bonds add, I think we learned that last in the mm -hmm. first term, pi bonds give you more intrinsic electronegativity. So now this is going to be a better acid. It's going to be um, a pKa of 25 is for alkynes. So alkyne would be your better choice if you want to form a carbanion. A carbanion from an alkyne can be produced if we if we attack it with uh, sodium hydride. So if we have a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here, then these two are going to form that and the, um, let's see, they're gonna take a pair of electrons with them. Yes, okay, so let, let's let's try to use, um, let's try to use our curved arrows. So if, um, I don't know if this is gonna work. I would go from here, there, and then this goes here, like that, and we form that with this bond, and those electrons go back here to this carbon, and we end up with, with a negative charge. I think that's what happens. The reason I went that direction was with this increased electronegativity, the draw is electrons this way. So if if we're tracking the movement of electrons, we have to go from here. We can't go from there. We have to go from here to there. And that forms the bond between these two hydrogens. And then these two electrons have to be left behind on that carbon. Makes sense to me. <laughs> so once you form this uh, alkanide anion then um, it can become a strong attacking group for uh, an SN2 reaction so that's what's shown in that in the bottom uh, mechanism where that strong nucleophile attacks the R group the carbon on the R group and the bromine leaves and what it does is it forms a new carbon-carbon bond, right? 
Um, it's fairly simple to form carbon and other bonds like carbon oxygen, carbon sulfur, carbon fluorine, bromine, all these others. But only a few reactions specifically give you the type of carbon-carbon bond. You change the carbon skeleton, they say. Those are very useful reactions. This is one of them. Well, when you take this carbanolid and attack your... Uh, there's your example there. So in that case, we get these two lone pairs form a bond with that carbon and this one. We'll do that then. Oh, that wasn't a chart. That was a prime. So then you get the bromine leaving uh, with its negative charge, and we form a bond here with that R group. This is a carbon carbon bond. Okay. How about uh, when we're talking about E2 and E1 reactions now, instead of calling them nucleophiles, <laughs> and, and many of the species that we've identified as nucleophiles also can act as bases because they will attack the hydrogen. So in order of base strength, in other words, how strongly will it attack the hydrogen? Uh, we find that um, the trend is not charge dependent. The trend is, is more related to the pKa. So the pKa of acetic acid is 4.75. Let's see. You're working on that one right now. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> or in that neighborhood. The pKa for um, pyridine is uh, 5.2, so it's a weaker acid. But that makes it, uh, remember, a weaker base makes stronger, uh, weaker acid makes stronger conjugate base. Right? So the weaker the acid, or the larger the pKa, the stronger the conjugate base. So the pKa's here that are listed in that chart are for the acid of that base. All right, so when we get out to the uh, uh, OH minus, the hydroxyl group, right, that PK is actually PKW. Right? That 14 is the PK for water. Since water is such a weak acid, OH minus is a very strong base. All right. So we're going to use this as an example of an E2 reaction where the acetate ion attacks that hydrogen that is mm. Mm. Oh, oh, okay, okay. It's got two chlorines on it, but the chlorine that's going to leave is the one that's anti to the hydrogen. So that means the chlorine on the other carbon has to leave. It wouldn't make any sense for the, the chlorine close to it to leave. Then you wouldn't have an E2 reaction because you need to uh, transfer electrons from that broken bond from the hydrogen and carbon into a, a pi bond between the two carbons. And that forces the, the beta carbon to, be, to exceed its octet, and then the chlorine has to leave. So that's an E2 reaction with acetate as the attacking group. Now, the other possibility is if we used hydroxyl. The hydroxyl group attacks the hydrogen just like the acetate did. We form the same compound uh, as the outcome, but which one occurs faster? The second one, yeah. The second one occurs faster because the OH minus is a stronger nucleophile a stronger base. Okay. And here again, we use that, uh, what was the name of that thing? Hammond. We use the Hammond postulate and look at the, the
the distance from reactants energy to the transition state. And we find that the stronger the base, the shorter the distance, the amount of energy required to go to the transition state before it, the reaction completes. And the reason that OH is a stronger base, well, we can look at it several ways. The pKa, of course, for water, or pKw is 14, whereas acetate is 4.7. So the stronger acid makes a weaker base. But if you look at the charged species, the acetate ion is more stable than the hydroxyl ion because it has a has a, two things. The acetate ion is larger for distribution of the electron charge, but more importantly, it has resonance available. Right? Methyl group down here, that, like that, and that, it can resonate between that one and this one. And resonance stabilizes. So the more stable the group, um, the lower energy. So that's why the acetate and its substrate are at lower energies than the hydroxyl and the substrate. All right. Um, so, since the rate of an E1 reaction is essentially independent of the strength of the base, so let me get that other way. Yeah. Since it's independent of the strength of the base, uh, E2 rate is highly sensitive to base strength, whereas E1 is not. E1 is not sensitive to base strength. Uh, Oh, okay, so here's the uh, misconception I had earlier. We're talking about hydroxyls as a base now, not as a nucleophile. Okay. So anything uh, hydroxyl or greater uh, in base strength uh, is considered strong, where anything less than hydroxyl is weak. And we've got a combination here of um, charged and uncharged species. I think it's all based upon their pK values, the pKs of their acids. Uh, okay. So if they're stronger, if they're OH minus and stronger, they favor E2s because they will readily attack a hydrogen and force the reaction. Whereas the, the weaker bases wait for the E1 reaction, wait for the leaving group to leave, then they attack. Okay. Uh, this is the phenoxide ion. Phenoxide, a strong base. Is it a strong base or a weak base? And will it tend to, get this out of the way, will it tend to favor the E1 or E2? Okay. What's the pKa for? Recognize that one. A phenol. You get it in uh, uh, what's that green stuff that you spray in your throat to super sore throats? Sometimes it's red, but the original was green. <sighs> Can't remember. Anyway, they put phenol in it as it deadens the nerves, but it's not particularly toxic. Okay. The pKa of this, of the conjugate acid of that one, uh, is what we need to determine. Compare it to the pKa of water um, and the conjugate acid of, uh, which is the conjugate acid of hydroxyl. So let's see, pKa of phenol is 10 and water is 14. So the since the phenol is significantly stronger than water, then the base is weaker than hydroxyl. 
Okay, so this phenoxide ion is weaker than hydroxyl. That makes it a, a weak base. So an E1 would be favored. All right. Then there's the problem of steric hindrance. Just because, just because we've got a charge, we've got a uh, uh, a strong conjugate base. Sometimes the um, well, actually, uh, we're looking at a comparison of E two and SN two. So the steric hindrance of this um, strong let's see strong conjugate base. This is a weak acid where you have uh, carbon, and then you have three methyls. Right, we did have that. Right? Now, that's an extremely weak acid. That makes this a very strong base. And it also makes it a strong nucleophile. Um, if, if we're attacking a, a carbon, with nothing but hydrogens, then there's nothing to hinder it from an SN2 reaction. If those hydrogens are small, they're not getting in the way. This will attack that carbon and that leaving group will go. Right. Uh, excuse me. Back. The leaving group will go when this one attacks that carbon. That's for an SN2. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Well, now they they made me a liar. The steric hindrance is not from the substrate. The steric hindrance is from the from this thing. It's got these methyl groups out here getting in the way, All right? So we can't approach this close because the negative charges of the bonds here are going to repel the negative charges of these bonds. Okay, so it made me a liar. Steric hindrance here will not favor SN2. But if this, rather than as a nucleophile, this we treat this as a base, and it attacks a hydrogen, it right, forms a bond with that hydrogen, and then this, uh, these, wait a minute. We're just talking about a proton transfer. Right? Now they've changed this to some something else. Actually, that's a carbon. This is a. Then this is going to transfer those electrons over here. All right. So then we form the double bond. All right. I was saying, I was thinking to myself, wait a minute. If there's only one carbon here, how do you form a double bond? <laughs> right. Can't do it. Right. Uh, so this has to have a carbon in it. That's the only way you can do that. All right, here's some bulky bases. Tertiary butoxide, tertiary butyl alcohol. And what we're saying here is with this, well, let me just use the one I've already put up here. This is tertiary butyl. One carbon, two, three, four, All right, but from butane. So this is an isobutane, but that carbon is tertiary. It's, it's attached to one, two, three carbons. So that's tertiary butyl alcohol. Well, the butoxide anion would be missing that and have that charge. The neopentoxide, we just add a carbon. And then, yeah. And then we put the oxygen up. This has two hydrogens on And then lithium diisopropylamide. Uh, what we're showing here is 
uh, strong bases, but bulky bases. So if you use a strong bulky base, the SN2 reaction is not favored. Uh, whereas the E2 reaction is favored. That's the whole point of this exercise. You said uh, E2 is? E2 would be favored, yes. It would attack the hydrogens. There's no problem with attacking hydrogens here uh, on some substrate. Um, uh, this, yeah, this would attack the hydrogen on that bond, and then those electrons would go over here. Uh, I think we had a carbon in there, didn't we? And these would go. That. Right. <clears throat> yeah, the steric hindrance is not a problem for E2s because you're attacking hydrogens. But the the SN2s would be a problem because you're trying to get in there and attack that carbon when you have these other groups around here getting in the way. Okay, uh, just a reminder of the empirical rate laws. SN2s have two factors. S E2 has two factors. SN1 and E1 only have one factor in their uh, rate laws. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I missed that point. Okay. Second factor is concentration of attacking species. So the first factor was the strength of the attacking species, either as a nucleophile or a base. That's the number one factor to consider when you're deciding whether it's a SN2, 1, E2, or 1. Second factor is the concentration of the attacking species. For high concentrations of strong nucleophiles or bases, they favor uh, SN2 or E2 reactions over the SN1 and the E1. Low concentrations of strong nucleophiles or bases will promote slow reactions <clears throat> of SN2 or E2 simply because they're part of the expression, right? The rate equals K times the concentration of the uh, uh, nucleophile and has uh, its order and then the substrate with its order. So the rate is dependent upon the concentration of the nucleophile, or we could put a base in there and work the same way. Um, this would be for SN2. But for an SN1, the rate is only related to that. It's not related to the concentration of the nucleophile. So if the concentration of the nucleophile is in this expression and not in this one, SN2 or E2 is favored for high concentrations of strong nucleophiles or bases. Uh, weak nucleophiles or bases tend to favor SN1 or E1 reactions because they don't have the oomph <laughs> to force the leaving group to leave. So if you have um, high concentrations of the nucleophile or base, SN2, E2 fa is favored. Low concentrations of strong nucleophiles um, will promote slow SN2 or E2 reactions, um, which means that the SN1 or the E1 reaction is favored. Now, they're various, low is a relative term. Right. How low is low? You might have to go really, really low to favor an SN1 or an E1. But that's for strong nucleophiles and bases. Weak nucleophiles or bases tend to favor SN1 or E1 reactions, regardless of their concentration. And if we put the, um, uh, here's a note. We assume that the attacking species is high concentration unless the 
uh, mechanism states that it's dilute. That's what DIL means. You can assume that it's um, high concentration. Okay. How about we state which reactions are favored by high concentration of HS minus and be a low concentration of HS minus. Okay, so first of all, is HS minus a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? Is it a strong base or a weak base? We classify HS minus, HS minus as a strong nucleophile because it possesses a minus charge. That was pretty simple. And it has lots of lone pairs. Um, but it's a weak base. So what does that mean? If it's a weak base, that's a weak base. That means it had to be formed from H2S. This must be a strong acid. Hydrosulfuric acid is strong. So this is weak. Let's see. I didn't have you in first semester. Nomenclature. No. Right. We name acids. Remember when you name acids? If there's an oxygen there, you don't say hydro. But if there's no oxygen, you start with hydro and then sulfuric. Okay. Just checking. So this is like a really dumb question. So when we say like sulfuric acid, like it's an acid. Mm -hmm. But why don't we say like whatever, whatever base? Or can acids, like when we say like sulfuric acid, could it also be weak? Like just like, you know, when we say acid in the name, when we say acid in the name, yeah, that means it has a dissociable hydrogen in, in the makeup right here. It has a proton to donate. This is a strong acid. Produces a weak base. Hydrogen sulfate base. That's weak. They're both weak. <clears throat> but this one, since this is a... Uh, a weak base, it's also a weak acid because it has another proton. So we can go like this, give up another proton. Now this is a strong base because it wants to go back here. That's the funny thing about polyprotics. This is a strong acid for the first proton, not for the second one. Um, however, for uh, phosphoric acid, they're all weak. So uh, this would be a strong base. That's a weak acid, strong base. This would be a stronger base. This would be the strongest base. Right, if we take a proton from each one, we get stronger bases as you go down because the acids get weaker. I don't know if I answered your question or muddied the waters. Yeah, you did. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's get back to answering our question. Uh, HS minus is a strong nucleophile because it possesses a minus charge, right? So it's it's looking for a carbon with a uh, slightly positive charge, right? Remember, uh, a slight positive charge, not a full positive charge, not a formal charge. So if it can find one, it will attack that carbon. But the HS minus is a weak base because that's a strong acid. Uh, H, H2S is 7.2 pKa which is significantly lower than 14, right? So that means uh, since hydroxyl is our uh, breaking line for strong and weak, and 14 is the, the acid that gives, you, gives rise to hydroxyls, that means hydroxyl is very strong, but 7.2 pKa will give us a, uh, a weak base. Actually, the pKb for that would be what? That 
That's the PKV. That's not particularly strong. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means um, HS minus being a strong nucleophile, if it's a high concentration, the SN2 is favored over SN1. It's going to force the leaving group to leave as a strong nucleophile. If it's a low concentration, then it's going to favor an SN1 reaction because there's not enough of it to force the leaving group to leave, so it has to wait. And then HS minus is a weak base, which will favor E1 over E2, regardless of the concentration. I know this is a lot to take in. Yeah. Factor number three, <laughs> in order of importance. So what have we covered so far? The strength of the attacking species and the concentration. Those are the two main factors. Third factor is how good is the leaving group, right? And I mentioned earlier that the leaving group, uh, it's the ability of the group to leave uh, whether it's good or not so good, is based upon its stability after it leaves. Is it stable after it leaves? And there, there are a couple of factors that play into that. Um, first, we're going to look at this example, this um, alkyl tosylate, um, OTS. It's uh, R-O-T-S. So this R could be anything. It's, it's a carbon group. R is usually carbon groups of some kind. And um, the SN2 reaction um, for uh, if we're comparing the alkyl chloride versus the alkyl tosylate, so what's that mean is the leaving group is the tosylate ion, right? That red part that leaves. Substitute a chloride in there. And we find out, experimentally, that an SN2 reaction occurs 300 times faster with that tosylate group on there than it does with chloride. And chloride is a pretty good leaving group. But this tosylate is, is much better. And this is for an SN2 reaction. Uh, for an SN1 reaction, it's even better. It's 10,000 times better for an SN1 reaction. So why is it a good leaving group? Let's see. I think they cover that on the next page. Do they? Mm, yeah, we get to it in a little bit. It's, it's due to two things. Right? The stability. Well, it's due to one thing. The stability of the anion when it leaves. And why is it stable? Two reasons. The negative charge that it has when it leaves is distributed over a huge molecule that stabilizes it. The other reason is um, the word just flew out of my head. Uh, resonance. It's resonance stabilized. So that negative charge can can go up to the up one oxygen on top or it can go down to the oxygen on the bottom and the um, the phenyl group, no, the benzyl group attached to it has an increased electronegativity, which draws some of that charge away. All right, so these, this group, this tosylate ion is very stable. Iodine, for an SN2 reaction, iodide is, is pretty good as a leaving group. It's relatively stable. Bromide is not quite as stable. Chloride is not as, as, as not stable. Fluoride is is poor leaving group. <laughs> and uh, hydroxide, uh, amide, and the uh, uh, oxide ions are, are all poor leaving groups. By comparison. Uh, let's see. For an SN1 reaction, we find that um, the trend should be similar. 
Oh, we've got another one stuck out here. Okay, I'll talk about that one in just a second. There's our tosylate, uh, methyl tosylate ion. And let's see, water becomes a better leaving. Water becomes a pretty good leaving group for SN1 reactions. Well, that makes sense because once, if water leaves from a uh, a carbon bond, a carbon to the water to oxygen bond, then how stable is the water? It's extremely stable when it leaves. So that makes it a good leaving group for an SN1 reaction. So it leaves on its own. Whereas with the SN2, uh, water's not mentioned. Okay, so <laughs> never mind. Uh, this other one out here, let's see, I, I penciled in a note on the side. This is abbreviated as triflic acid, trifluoromethane sulfonic acid. And this is a, a very, very stable. It's even more stable than tosylate. I think it has to do with uh, two things. The... Um, Resonance, stabilization, and the fact that fluoride is very electronegative. And it draws electric charge away from that uh, extra charge on the oxygens better than the benzyl group. Not benzyl. That's phenyl group. Yeah, phenyl group. Right, benzyl has a carbon on it, right? Extra carbon yeah. outside. Phenyl is just the... the one. Is is just the, the yeah. ring. Yeah. I still get those backwards sometimes. Like that. I I have to think, okay, what's benzoic acid? Okay, benzoic acid is like this, like that. That's a carbon. Benzyl's from benzoic. Okay, so I got it now. Yeah. Phenol. Bad. Yeah, don't get me started. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was up. I was up to about eleven thirty working on this thing last night, <clears throat> so I didn't get a whole lot of sleep either. Okay, um, so leaving group ability is governed largely by the stability of the leaving group after it forms. So if the leaving group has to leave on its own, it's very sensitive to leaving group ability. So SN1s and E1s are very sensitive to leaving group ability. Whereas leaving group ability for an SN2 or E2 is uh, augmented by the attacking species. So it's not as sensitive to the leaving group. You can have... A, uh, a poorer leaving group for an SN2 and E2, as long as the nucleophile or the base is strong. But if you're looking at SN1 or E1, you need a good leaving group to promote that mechanism. Okay, so here are leaving groups. There's that uh, triflic acid way out there on the right. That's the best one. And then the tosylate. And then this one is uh, methylate, I think, is, is the way they pronounce that one, MSO. And then iodide, uh, ROH is a good leaving group. Water is a good leaving group. Uh, bromide chloride. And then poor leaving groups are all these negatives. The, the more unstable the negative charge, um, the poorer it is. And in fact, we even identified these guys down here as unsuitable. The hydride ion, the uh, methyl anion, the uh, amide ion, the hydroxyl ion, and the uh, uh, alkoxide ions are all unsuitable leaving groups. They will not work. So will we use unsuitable and unfeasible interchangeably, or is those like completely two different terms for it? Uh, 
I think they're used interchangeably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a good leaving group, then any one of these uh, SN2, 1, E2, 1 are feasible. Doesn't mean they're going to happen. It's a starting point. With poor leaving groups, um, only an SN2 or an E2 reaction tend to be feasible if the attacking group is strong. And then the unsuitable ones, um, they won't work no matter how good the attacking group is. Better leaving groups tend to be weak bases. Weak bases, okay. Better leaving groups are weak bases. All right. That means they have to be derived from strong acids. Hydroiodic acid is a very strong acid. H3O plus hydronium ion is a strong acid. Hydrobromic acid, hydrochloric acid, we know those are strong acids. And then the, the add a hydrogen to each one of those others on the left. And those are also very strong acids. So that makes them weak bases. So these are different sulfonates. What's the difference between a sulfate and a sulfonate? I often wonder that. A sulfonate is the, instead of the a hydroxyl or hydrogen attached to the, uh, hydroxyl attached to the sulfur, you have a carbon group attached to it. That's a sulfonate. So a mesylate, a, a tosylate, or a triflate, um, they're all sulfonates. Uh, conjugate bases of strong acids, these are weak bases. Right? So that means, what, what does that mean? That means they don't want hydrogens, right? Those anions do not want a hydrogen. They're weak bases. They will not accept hydrogens readily. So that means they're stable the way they are. Right. They're not looking around for hydrogens. All right. Suppose we have a poor leaving group. We want to convert it to a good leaving group. Right. That, we can do that. Right. For this, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. That's uh, propanol. Propane one all. If we combine it with sodium bromide, in aqueous solution, no reaction whatsoever because hydroxyl is not a good leaving group, right? It's a strong, hydroxide ion is a strong base. It doesn't want to leave. It's not stable when it leaves. Under acidic conditions, though, if we put hydrobromic acid in there and we do this to it, We have uh, these extra hydrogen ions, and the bromide ion is is um, is not part of this. So here we we take these um, that lone pairs, right? They form a bond with that hydrogen, and we have OH two uh, plus. Now you got a good leaving group. What is that? H2O? That's water. Like water is a good leaving group. So now what happens is those electrons, uh, yeah, electrons transfer there. That water leaves. And now we've got a, uh, let's see, I think we go through it on the next page, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, they're, they're excuse me. They're keeping the bromide in here like that. So now this goes like that. Now, excuse me. No, this. That gives you the bromide uh, anion. 
There you go. The bromide anion. And then it will undergo an SN2 reaction. Because now you have uh, okay, here's the leaving group. Right now we've got this. And this is going to attack that carbon. And this is going to cause the water to leave. So now we get this one. And water as our products. So, huh? This is hard stuff. I know. It's a lot to take in. We tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even though I've studied it before, it, mm -hmm. it, it it's faded. In trying to present it so that it's understandable, that's mm -hmm. even the harder. But this is not a, a good leaving group, so we had to convert it to a good leaving group by proton transfer. Right. That elementary step. Then when we get to this one, we get um, SN2. So this is a multi-step process in order to create a good leaving group. So are alcohols good leaving groups? Well, let's see. If we try that same reaction with this this species, uh, we don't get a reaction. But if we uh, if we protonate, let's see, mechanisms coming up. We in acidic solution, sodium bromide is going to be neutral solution. Right? Sodium hydroxide is a strong acid. Hydrogen. Uh, uh, Hydrobromic acid is a strong acid, so the salt, the sodium bromide, is a neutral. Right, this is a neutral solution. If instead we use a hydrobromic acid, making an acidic solution, and actually they've increased the temperature too, and it takes six to seven hours, <laughs> so it's not a particularly fast reaction. Then what we get is we're protonating that. O that uh, oxygen attached to the methyl group. And when we do that, here's the kicker. The leaving group is not the methyl. The uh, tendency is to say, all right, if we if we take this, we take this group here, let's see, put my double bonds in the right place, and we say, this is OH, and this is O, and this is CH3. But then once we uh, transfer the proton right here to that group, and we make this, um, yeah, then we make this one with a plus charge, and we add a hydrogen to it. Let's see. Probably got it. Lone pair in there, still got one lone pair. Yep. And we still got a methyl group. And now we had we have the bromide there. Right. That's proton transfer. The tendency is to say this is the leaving group. It's not. The leaving group is this. Right there. Because when it leaves, the, uh, let me see, let me complete the lift out this one. When it leaves, this um, diol is stable, very stable. This is the leaving group, and the bond here that forms, let's see, yeah. That now is the nucleophile attacking that carbon because this positive charge is drawing electron density away from that carbon, making it an electrophile. This nucleophile attacks it, forms the bond, and that pair goes up here, and now we have uh, the diode. So that's the thing that threw me off originally when I first saw this. I said, wait a minute. 
Yeah, I would assume the smaller. Yeah, that's the leaving group. The bigger one uh, stabilizes, is more stable, and the bromide is attacking that carbon right there. All right. So how about elimination reactions? Good leaving group can also facilitate a leaving uh, elimination reactions, such as uh, dehydration. So here we have um, uh, cyclohexol, hexanol. Yeah, cyclohexanol. In acidic solution at elevated temperature, and that phosphoric acid is concentrated, we end up with uh, cyclohexene in water. So how does that happen? Well, the um, the phenol, the cyclohexanol, is the, the attacking group. Yeah, it attacks the phosphoric acid, and the uh, cyclohexanol is protonated. Right, so now we have a good leaving group. We have the water. In that middle step, we have water, and then what happens? Well, it leaves. Right? This is a, an E1 reaction. The leaving group leaves and leaves us with a carbocation, and then the um, we get an electrophile elimination. In other words, water comes in and attacks that hydrogen, and now the electrons from the bond carbon-hydrogen bond are transferred uh, toward the carbocation side and form a pi bond. Right? And we've got uh, H3O+, plus. we've got the hydronium ion. So, this is known as dehydration. Whenever you remove a water molecule from something during a reaction, we call it dehydration. There are a number of different syntheses that involve dehydration. Biochemically speaking, dehydration is, is like bread and butter. Uh, and then the opposite of that, where you, you break a bond with hydration. Um, but I would point out that this environment is acidic. It's got uh, phosphoric acid in there which is a reactant, but one of the products of the reaction is hydronium ion. So you're, you're uh, balancing the acidic nature of the reaction matrix by continuing to produce those hydroniums. All right, uh, amines as leading groups. They're not very good leaving groups. We learned that earlier. So similarly, we just proton transfer, right? We make an um, ammonium salt. Uh, and then what? Like alcohols and ethers, amines tend not to undergo nucleophilic substitution or elimination reactions under normal conditions. Prot the protonation of the mildly basic nitrogen would make the leaving group better, but even under acidic conditions, amines tend not to act as substrates in nucleophilic substitution or elimination reactions. So we're stuck there. We just form the ammonium salt and that's it. It just stops. Now, if I go back and look at uh, leaving groups, good leaving groups, Yeah. That's not a good leaving group. So we're stuck there. Nothing happens. We just we just protonate it and that's it. And it's a dead end. Okay. Factor four. In importance. Factor number four. The fourth important fourth in order of importance are the factors that um, determine outcomes of competition among these reactants is hybridization. 
Um, what type of carbon bond is attached to the leaving group? These reactions, none of these reactions generally occur unless the carbon uh, atom bonded to the leaving group is sp3 hybridized. This is partly because of the nature. Remember, uh, the nature of sp3, sp2, and sp hybridization. Right? What's the nature of that bond? It's more like this is more like a P bond. So the S character, S character, for this bond, this hybridization is only 25%. Right. This one is 33% S character. And this one is 50% S character. S character implies sigma bonding. It's more closely related to and stronger sigma bond. So we need that bond to be weak in order for the leaving group to leave. So if you move toward SP hybridization, you've strengthened the bond too much. Nothing's going to leave. So that's why hybridization as an SP3 bonded to the leaving group is the best. Uh, in fact, uh, SN1, E1 reactions don't occur with SP2 or SP hybridization. And those are our examples at the bottom. That, that leaving group will not leave from a double bonded carbon or from a triple bonded carbon. Um, the other approach that they're mentioning here is that those carbocations are very, very unstable. Right. They're primaries or secondaries, but the electronegativity, the uh, electronegativity of the bonded groups to that carbon uh, make it more positive. And the more positive it is, the, the more unstable it is. Okay. So we also get this issue... Uh, actually, this is an extension of what I was just talking about. SN2 reactions are further hindered by electrostatic repulsion when the leaving group is attached to an SP2 or an SP hybridized. So uh, when this uh, nucleophile is trying to attack the carbon, then it also encounters those that pi cloud. Uh, if you've got the sigma cloud that's on axis, then you have the pi cloud for the bonding between the two carbons. And that's extra electron density out here in space and it gets in the way of a nucleophile because nucleophiles are have a negative formal charge. All right, so that's another hindering factor for SN2 reactions. Okay. So if we if we do in fact have sp3 hybridized carbon uh, alkyl group, which is what they're saying, the as the number of alkyl groups attached to the carbon uh, bonded to the leaving group increases, the SN2 reaction rate sharply decreases. So we find that uh, a methyl group attached to bromide, uh, where the leaving group is bromine. Uh, occurs 4,000 times faster than the bromide attached to a uh, primary carbon. But that carbon attached to another carbon is primary. If it's attached to two carbons, secondary. If it's attached to three, it's, it's tertiary. So the more carbons the leaving group is attached to, the slower the rate of the SN2 reaction. Now, are they going to explain it to us? Yeah, okay. It's largely due to steric hindrance. If you've got an SN2 reaction, then the nucleophile has to get in there at that carbon. And if, the, if it's attacking a methyl group, then it's got nothing in the way but hydrogens. 
If it's a primary carbon, it's got a methyl group in there that's sticking out there, getting in the way. If there are two methyl groups or even uh, it slows things down, way down. If there are three methyl groups out there <coughs> or three carbon groups of any kind with the carbon attached to the leaving group, then that reaction won't occur. You can just throw that one out. If the carbon attached to the leaving group is also attached to three other carbons, then the SN2 reaction will not happen. Due to steric hindrance. How about SN1 reaction? All right. SN1 reaction is the other way around because the leaving group has to leave first. So what stabilizes the carbocation when the leaving group leaves? the number of carbons it's attached to. So, um, for an SN1 reaction, a tertiary carbon attached to the leaving group is favorable. So that, the tertiary carbon favors the SN1 while it's impossible for an SN2 due to steric hindrance. And it's just the opposite. So how about uh, what happens to the rate with an SN1 or an E1 versus carbocation stability? Well, the more stable the carbocation, the faster the rate. SN1s and E1s, because they both form carbocations. When the leaving group leaves, it leaves behind that positive carbon. So the more stable that carbon, the faster the rate, because that is the rate determining step. The stability of the carbocation tells you that that rate determining step is faster because the outcome is more stable. All right, how about this one? Um, which substrate A or B undergoes an E1 reaction faster? Well, if, if it's an E1, then the leaving group has to leave, right? That tosylate has to leave. And A, it's leaving a secondary carbocation behind, right? Okay. On the right, it's leaving a tertiary carbon behind. So B, the, the B side, should be a faster rate. Yeah, this is more stable. That was easy. What are we doing all the time? Hour and a half to get how far? I'm I'm through with number four. Yeah. Okay. We're on slide forty-eight. We're getting ready to slide forty-nine. Okay, we're almost halfway. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that was a good choice to just make this chapter for one exam by itself. Yeah. This is all. Okay, so we, we solved that one. How about E2 reactions? E2 reactions are relatively insensitive to the number of alkyl groups on the carbon bonding to the leaving group. So let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, that's because the base is attacking hydrogen, not the carbon. That hydrogen sticking out there. There's no steric hindrance. Um, you just attack that hydrogen, and all these hydrogens are, have similar acidities. All right, they're alkyl acidities, about pKa of 50. All right, so the, the attacking base, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't care. That hydrogen is going to leave with the same uh, pull, whether it's on a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon. Well, actually, they're all primaries, right? That carbon right there, let's see, here's my cursor flitting around. Each of these carbons attached to the hydrogen are primary carbons, so that has no impact on the uh, reaction rate.
Okay, this is a summary. In fact, I think I put that in uh, one of your handouts. I'll pull these out. Yeah, uh, no, not that one. There's another one in there. Those are labs. There's your sample test. Yeah, that one right there. Okay. So this sort of summarizes everything we've done so far. Uh, the, well, actually, it summarizes the influence of the number of alkyl groups on the carbon. So the number of alkyl groups on the carbon, um, uh, let's see, feasibility of SN2, 1, E2, 1 reactions, type of substrate, okay? If it's a methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary carbon, Okay, feasibility. If we're looking at an SN2 mechanism, then it will go with a methyl primary or secondary, but not with a tertiary. Okay, and we looked at uh, SN1. Did we look at, I don't remember looking at SN1. SN1 means the leaving group leaves a carb, uh, carbocation behind. Okay, yeah, we did look at that. Uh, so SN1 and E1 both leave carbocations behind. Methyl carbocation and primary carbocations are very, very unlikely. Right? So you can you can throw them out. If you've got the possibility of forming a methyl or a primary carbocation, SN1 and E1 are impossible. But um, uh, secondary and tertiary are more likely. E2, on the other hand, uh, requires that the uh, base attack a hydrogen. And, ah, okay. So the primary, secondary, and tertiary for an E2 are, they're insensitive to the, um, For the prime, they're insensitive to primary, secondary, tertiary carbon formation as a carbocation because we're attacking the hydrogen. Um, but uh, actually, E2 is a single step, so you don't form a carbocation. Sorry, confusing myself. But E1 uh, does form a carbocation. And for the, the primary carbocation, it's very unstable, so it's not going to do that. But it's grayed out. E1 is grayed out for the methyl because when, you, when the leaving group leaves, there's no other carbon for the carbon to bond to. You can't form a pi bond with empty space, right? <laughs> so that's why the, the methyl E1 is grayed out because it's impossible. It, it can't happen. But the rest of them are logical. I saw that was kind of funny because there was no explanation given for for that in the uh, in the text or in the notes from the author. I said, "Wait a minute, why is that?" And then it dawned on me, right? The consequence of an E one or an E two is a pi bond, right? You can't form a pi bond with itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the formation of an allyl cation and benzyl cation. Okay, we're we're comparing the two. If the leading group is bonded to a primary allyl, so an allyl is if you have um like that and like that, this is the allyl where the carbon is uh, uh, beta to the double bond. That's the allyl carbon. It's a primary carbon versus the benzyl carbon. Let's see. Well, let's be consistent, right? This is what they used here. Like that, like that, like that. And this has two hydrogens and there's your leading. Okay, the benzyl, yes, the benzyl because there's a carbon attached to it. Let's see, put them in the same place they have. 
here, here, here. Okay, and then this carbon has two hydrogens attached to it in the leaving group. Okay, compare those two uh, for an um, The uh, SN2 and SN1 reactions are both feasible. Now, of course, the, the SN2 reaction simply will attack uh, this carbon here or here, right next to the leading group. Remember, in an SN1 or an SN2 reaction, the attack always occurs on the carbon that's right next to the leading group. Right? It's attached to the carbon uh, with the leading group. That's where the attack occurs for an SN2, if you hadn't noticed that already. Uh, so these are feasible for SN2. Uh, SN1, uh, is it also feasible? Well, if you form... And SN1, of course, is going to form a carbocation. Let's see. Here, here, like that. Yeah, like that. Okay. So this can be resonance stabilized. By... Uh, Proton transfer. Right, so we can get um, instead of one, two proton shift. Let's see, I left out uh, hydrogen, here. Yeah, hydrogen here. So this is resonance stabilized. So this SN1 reaction uh, is uh, doable. Or what's the proper term? Feasible, right? It's feasible. This one is also stabilized by the fact that uh, by a slightly different mechanism it's stabilized by its association with this uh, phenyl ring. Okay, so they're both stable. Stable carbocations. Okay. All right, which substrate A or B would undergo an SN1 reaction faster? SN1. So where's the leaving group? I assume the chloride is the leaving group. So it would have to attack that carbocation. It would form, it would form the carbocation by the chloride leaving, and it would form a uh, secondary. Right? A secondary carbon. Where the, you know, this is this is terminology time. Secondary carbons we've assumed have always been attached to two different two carbons, but if it's attached to an oxygen, it's also called a secondary. All right. So, what type of carbocation would would substrate A produce in the rate determining step? If this is SN one, then it has to form a carbocation, <coughs> and there's the possibility. When the chloride leaves, it leaves behind a carbocation, excuse me, and uh, there is raisin, there is possibility of resonance stabilization between the carbocation and the um, oxycation, right, by forming that double bond. That's more stable. So A should undergo SN1 reaction faster. Yeah, A would undergo SN1 reaction faster because of that stabilization of the carbocation with its resonance structure. Okay, uh, factor, what factor is that? Get out of the way. Five. Factor five. Okay, got five and then six. And that's all the factors, and then we put them together. So factor five is solvent effects. Um, I mentioned sometimes in general chemistry how um, 
the solvent can participate in the reaction. It can be a reactant, or in this case, it can influence the um, it can influence the nucleophile or the base. <clears throat> Protic solvents are ones that possess hydrogen bond donor. In this case, we've got an anion there, which is the nucleophile, and water associates with it uh, through the uh, partial positive charge on the hydrogens. Right. And what that effectively does is it weakens the nucleophile. It's strongly solvated. It stabilizes it. So now it's not as strong as a nucleophile anymore. So protic solvents tend to favor SN1 and E1 reactions, right? Where, where there's no dependence on the strength of the nucleophile or the base. Got something in your eye? No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Whereas aprotic solvents do not possess hydrogen bond donors. And they would favor the SN2 or the E2 reactions, where the nucleophile now, we assume is strong. The nucleophile now has the opportunity, since it's not solvated, to uh, attack the carbon. It still retains its um, nucleophilic strength. That's the whole, that's solvent effects in a nutshell. Aprotic versus protic. Uh, so uh, we use water as an example there. What could be some other protic solids? Anything that can form a hydrogen bond. Methanol, ethanol. Um, acetone in the right-hand side is an aprotic solid. The reason being that even though there's an oxygen there, it's not attached to a hydrogen, right? There's no possibility of hydrogen bonding. Plus that slight positive charge on the carbon is um, masked by the methyl groups. So there's my explanation through that end. Large concentration of positive charge on a well-exposed hydrogen atom enables water to strongly solvate negative charges. And then, so a strong ion-dipole interaction weakens the attacking species. That favors SN1 and E1 because now the reaction rate is not dependent upon the um, nucleophile or the base as the case may be. Whereas with an aprotic solvent, partial positive end of the net dipole is buried inside the solvent molecule, which severely decreases the ability of acetone to solvate the negative charge. So the ion dipole interactions are much weaker. And that favors an SN2 and E2 reaction. Now the strong nucleophile, the strong base, is not hindered by the solvent. And there are a whole bunch of aprotic solvents that are available. Uh, I think we'll, uh, acetone is one of them. Uh, DMSO is another one. Dimethyl sulfoxide is, is often used as an aprotic solvent. Here we go. So reaction rates in various solvents for the SN2 reaction. Uh, so our, our SN2 reaction here is the azide ion is the nucleophile and bromide is the leading group. So what's the relative rate of this reaction? Well, in methanol and water, it's pretty slow. Right? In DMSO or DMF, which is uh, dimethylformamide, or uh, methyl cyanide, or acetonitrile, that's another name for it. 
that bottom one, CH3CN. Mm -hmm. I think people like to call it acetonitrile because it doesn't it it doesn't um, uh, imply the deadly character of cyanide, but methyl cyanide is a proper name. But these aprotic solvents uh, promote the SN2 reaction, whereas the protic solvents inhibit it. Uh, how about SN1 reactions? Well, let's see. Um, the protic solvents tend to accelerate the activity of an SN1 reaction. Why is that? Well, let's see. Iodide has to leave, forming the carbocation. And the iodide then is, uh, is well, it's a good leaving group. Is the iodide stabilized by the protic solvent? And the carbocation stabilized by the protic solvent? Possibly. And then the chloride attacks. Hope there's an explanation on the next slide. Uh, relative nu uh, nucleophilicities in protic and aprotic salts. Okay. So if we're comparing... For the nucleophile, uh, attacking that methyl group and bromide is the leaving group, then if the nucleophile is, let's see, nucleophile, okay, they're stacked. So we've got one, uh, one table on top and another table on the bottom. That's because we couldn't get them all in one straight line. So we're increasing from left to right and then skip down and increasing from left to right again. So the rate of the reaction, um, the nucleophilicity of bromide and ethanol is about 30 times greater than that of chloride. The nucleophilicity. Ah. That's because of charge density. Right? Bromide is a bigger ion and chloride. Chloride has a, a concentrated negative charge compared to bromide. So that means it's going to be more easily hydrated by protic solvents. Yeah. That's more solvated, I should say, not hydrated, solvated. Okay. Uh, and I think we can use a similar reasoning, right? Fluoride. As a, as a nucleophile, fluoride is even less so than chloride because it's a smaller ion, much smaller. So it, it's more easily solvated by protic solvents. In this case, ethanol. <clears throat> All right. Uh, contrary to uh, dimethylformamide, an aprotic solvent in which chloride is stronger nucleophile than bromide. So we're switching. Right, from chloride to bromide. In a protic solvent, chloride is a stronger nucleophile. In a protic solvent, bromide is. This reversal occurs in protic solvents because chloride is substantially smaller. Okay, I mentioned that. You also notice that chloride and bromide are in two pe different periods. When your ions, when your nucleophiles are coming from two different periods, then you see this flip flop. And it's largely due to that ion size. Uh, let's see. Protic solvents have a larger energy barrier. I don't like that explanation. I like mine better. Yeah, it makes more sense. Now, this may be true, but it doesn't help me any. Uh, I do have some explanations here. With a higher concentration of negative charge, chloride is solvated much more strongly in protic solvents. Therefore, protic solvents weaken chloride much more. Okay, that's the explanation I went for first. Then we see a reversal of nucleophilicity in protics versus aprotic solvents when both of these criteria are met. The nucleophiles have negative charges localized on, an, on a single atom, not resonance stabilized. And 
the atoms bearing the negative charge are in different rows of the periodic table. Okay, you see that reversal. Come on, there we go. However, if we compare nucleophiles with localized negative charges on atoms in the same row of the periodic table, then protic solvents do not reverse nucleophilicities. I think that's because the, the size difference uh, is not great enough to make an impact. All right, the last one, E, temperature. The least of the factors is temperature. What effect does temperature have on uh, choosing among these different um, products? All right. Uh, for this example, we have 2-bromopropane, which is uh, reacting with methanol in basic solution at 45 degrees. Okay. The substitution product would uh, add the hydroxyl, and the bromide would be the leaving group. So we get this hydroxyl. The elimination product forms this... Um, uh, propene in roughly equal amounts. If we increase the temperature, we're going to favor the elimination reaction. Higher temperatures, elimination becomes more favored. Increasing the temperature of the reaction tends to promote elimination more than substitution. Okay, now why is that? Okay, here's my explanation. Goes back to Gibbs free energy and the uh, free energy equation. Notice that with the substitution reaction, we get, uh, we have two reactants, two products. So the entropy hasn't changed any. Right? You got two on one side and two on the other. Entropy hasn't changed. But if you go from uh, two reactants to three products, then you have greater entropy in the elimination reaction and greater entropy it favors the reaction. All right. Um, also, delta G, delta H minus T, delta S. Under what conditions would the entropy, would the delta G be more negative? You can make the delta G more negative. Delta H is, is reasonably constant. It, it'll change some with temperature, but it doesn't change much. What we're looking at is this term right here. If you make this temperature very large, then this whole term becomes more negative. And if that's more negative, then this is more negative. And if delta G is more negative, then the rate increases for that reaction. So increasing the temperature will increase the probability that elimination will come out with a higher yield. Okay. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to look at strategies for combining all these effects and decide who's the winner. Now, uh, if you've looked at um, the uh, bright space, I put two connect two links in there. One was to Professor Dave's explanation of, of this competition. And the other one was to... Uh, the, the lady, I forget her name. Uh, um, the yeah. one you said earlier, yeah, yeah. Leah. Leah, yeah. Uh, she's got a, an explanation. I didn't have time to look at the whole thing, but uh, if it's anything like her previous ones, it'll be good. So you can look at, at uh, either one or both of them. Uh, Professor Dave gives a pretty good explanation of how to tell the difference. Is it Professor Dave explains? Yes. I like him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I watch his videos. His... Um, his earlier videos when he had long hair and tattoos <clears throat> are better than his more recent ones. His more recent ones are politically motivated. Yeah. But his earlier ones are, are good. He talks as if he's he's a trained organic chemist. 
I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, our reaction here is this uh, S2 chloropentane in uh, sodium bromide and DMSO is the solvent. So that's our that's our starting point. And we want to decide, first of all, uh, are any one of these uh, mechanisms feasible? So we have to decide first, step one is the leaving group should be at least as, as stable as fluoride. Fluoride's a good leaving group in, in those terms. Right? So we got that going for us. Uh, we don't have unsuitable leaving groups like uh, hydroxyl or um, alkoxide or amide or hydride or uh, whatever the R minus is. The leaving group should be bonded to an sp3 hybridized carbon. And it is. That carbon is sp3 hybridized. Remember, when, when there's uh, two lines come together, that's a carbon. And if there's nothing else shown, there's no charge or anything else attached to it, then there has to be a hydrogen there too. So that carbon attached to the chloride, chlorine, is sp3 hybridized. That's good. Um, a recognizable attacking species should be present to act as the nucleophile of the base. Right? So we do have an attacking species, the bromide. Bromide is, is a good attacking species. And that's why I put those notes down at the bottom. I had to modify the slides a little bit, so it keep me on track. All right, so we got step one solved, and any one of these um, could be satisfied with those conditions as they're stated now. Then we go to step two. Rule out the reactions that are unfeasible. So if... Uh, if the carbon is tertiary, we don't consider an SN2. The reason being steric hindrance. Right? The attacking species can't get anywhere near that carbon because of steric hindrance. Right? So if it's an, uh, a tertiary carbon, we don't consider SN2. In this case, it's a uh, secondary carbon. So that's possible. SN2 is possible. If it's a primary or methyl carbon, we don't consider SN1 because the carbocation would be unstable, or E1 um, uh, for the same reason, because they have to go through the carbocation stage. Well, and the methyl carbon, of course, E1 would be impractical. Uh, unless there's resonance stabilization, and I don't see any in this one. No possibility of resonance stabilization. So um, SN1 or E1 are possible. Um, are there, uh, for, for E2 or E1s, are there beta hydrogens? Yeah, I think there are, right? If the alpha hydrogen is, is uh, where the uh, carbocation would form, then the betas are on either side. Right? We have beta hydrogens. We can't rule out any of the reactions from the type of substrate, the leaving group, or the absence of beta hydrogens, right? So, uh, the, and the solvent is aprotic. If it's aprotic, then we can rule out SN1 and E1. Now, why is that? If it's aprotic, we can rule out SN1. Oh, carbocations are stabilized in protic solvents. Right. Because with that charge, they can be solvated. That stabilizes them. Okay, so SN1 and E1 are ruled out in the aprotic solvent. That solvent tells us that we're either SN2 or E2. All right. <clears throat> Which of the remaining reactions are favored by the attacking species? SN2 is favored by a strong nucleophile. Is bromide a strong nucleophile? I think it is. Yeah, it's charged. SN1 is favored by a weak nucleophile or by a low concentration. 
It's not a low concentration because it doesn't say dilute. E2 is favored by a strong base. E1 is favored by a weak base. Uh, I thought we already ruled out SN1 and SN1. Uh, Attacking species bromide is a strong nucleophile, which favors SN2 and SN1. So I guess I'll look at SN2. Yeah, so we throw out SN1. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, bromide is a weak base. It favors E1 over E2. Uh, since E1 is unfeasible, SN2 is the winner. That's a lot of work. Yeah. And then... Is, is like, I have a hard time comprehending how this applies to real life. Like, how do we know that that's exactly what they're going to do? Just because we work this out, does, oh, does that mean it's going to happen? No. See, that's why I, I don't... It's it. more likely to happen. Okay. Right? It's all probability. We're trying to narrow down the options, trying to throw out the ones that are totally unreasonable. All right. When, when it's all said and done, the proof is in the pudding. Right? Go in the lab. Does it work? Does it produce what you expect it to? We're learning here how to um, cut our losses <laughs> and when we go in the lab. But, yeah, you're right. It, um. This is not definitive. Um, in fact, I think organic chemistry is more intuitive than other chemistries. Uh, you just get a feel for it and you go for it. Yeah, yeah I think that that's probably why a lot of uh, chemistry students um, either love it or hate it. Yeah. And step four is apply uh, a tiebreaker if you have any remaining reactions. Uh, if you have a, a, if you're between SN1 and E1 reactions, determine whether heat is added to the reaction. If heat's added to the reaction, E1 is favored. Uh, we've already seen why that is. Uh, if SN2 or E2 are need to be tie broken, uh, determine whether the attacking species acts better as a base than as a nucleophile. Right, and that that requires that we look at the strength of the nucleophile versus the uh, basicity. You know, is, is it a strong base? We had an example where we had a strong nucleophile but a weak base for the same species. And then uh, if it acts as a, a better base than a nucleophile, then it, it favors the E2 because it's going to attack hydrogens. But um, and if it's bulky, right? Uh, attacking species. If it's bulky, then it definitely it favors an E two, right? Because it can't get in there to attack the carbon. All right. So uh, after the apply steps two through four. All right, after the initial feasibility, then we we move our way down through the selections and uh, cross out the reactions that can be ruled out. The aprotic solvent got rid of S, uh, SN1 and E1. All right, so now we're down to step three, and we're looking at, um, uh, let's see, the nature of the nucleophile or the base. All right, that's step three, isn't it? Let me go back and see. I don't want to tell you something wrong. Oh, well, there are several things involved. Rule out the reactions that are unfeasible. And we find that the strong nucleophile favors NS, uh, SN2. Weak base favors E1. So E1's already eliminated, so it's uh, between SN2 and E2, and, and SN2 wins. We can skip the tiebreaker.
So here we've, once you decide which one is the reaction mechanism, then we can say something about the stereochemistry. Right? We decided this, is, this reaction is an SN2, most likely an SN2 conversion. So when we do that, we know that SN2 requires a backside attack because the front side attack is too much steric hindrance, too much electric electron density gets in the way. So it has to attack from the back and that changes its stereochemistry from, a, from an S to an R. Uh, okay. How about this one? Ooh, that's an odd. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, four, five. Okay, so this is uh, one, two, uh, two bromo, two ethyl pentane. All right, <laughs> I think I got that one right. And we're going to react it with methanol and heat. That's what that that delta right there. When you have a reaction uh, arrow and you have a delta on it, that means heat. So we're going to heat it up. Okay, that's shorthand. Uh, so cross out the reactions that can be ruled out. An SN2 reaction. The leaving group is on a tertiary carbon, right? There's no way that that um, that methanol can get in there and attack that carbon. Or the, actually, the uh, the alcohol group. There's no way we can get in there and attack that carbon. Steric hindrance is too great. So SN2 is definitely out. That's a tertiary substrate. Uh, so then we go to uh, step three. Well, we've already assumed that step one, it's feasible. Right? The carbon is uh, SP3 hybridized. There's a suitable leaving group and there's a suitable attacking group. Uh, so we've we've skipped step one and gone straight to step two. Now we eliminated the tertiary substrate for SN2. And we look at uh, anything that we can eliminate, step three. Weak nucleophile favors SN1. That's a weak nucleophile, the methanol group. Uh, a weak base favors E1. So SN1, E1 are possible because the leaving group has to leave before we can get any action out. That's the idea. Uh, E2 is eliminated because the base isn't strong enough. The base will not go in there and uh, and grab a hydrogen off of that second, off any one of those uh, beta carbons. Right. There are three beta carbons there. You see that? Okay. Uh, so we need a tiebreaker. Heat favors the elimination or the substitution. So E1 wins. This is going to be an E1 mechanism. The bromine leaves carbocation behind, which is stabilized as a tertiary carbon, carbocation. And then we can go in and uh, attack the hydrogen. So here's what you see first, the heterolysis, the bromine leaves, it leaves a carbocation behind, and then the uh, beta carbon, hydrogen on the beta carbon is attacked by the uh, hydroxyl group. And that hydrogen is uh, eliminated, leaving, uh, leaving the two pair of electrons behind. They go to the a bond between the alpha and the beta carbon and form a, a, a pi bond. So our product is 3-ethylpent-2-E. All right, now we're going to say anything about. Oh, there's the possibility of a minor product. Let's go back. SN1. Okay, yeah, SN1. We eliminated SN1 based upon heat. Heat favors elimination, but we saw earlier that it didn't completely eliminate it. 
I mean, we said eliminate it, but it doesn't. Uh, it favors the elimination reaction. But the SN1 is still a possibility of a, uh, in a minor a minor product. Right? So we get the heterolysis again. Now, the uh, base becomes a, excuse me, the base becomes a, um, a nucleophile. It attacks that carbocation. It doesn't do a very good job of it because there's a lot of steric hindrance in there. But when it forms that forms that bond with the oxygen, the outcome is an ether. Like we form that ether bond. And that's a by a, a proton transfer. It's a minor product. Okay. So here we have another example. This one is, don't ask me to name that compound. <laughs> it's a, it's a one, let's see. Uh, let's see. We will probably start on the uh, tussle. Would that be right? One, two, three, six, four, two, three. No, smaller, smaller would be starting on a methyl. So methyl, trimethyl. One, two, four, trimethyl. Three tosylate. A uh, three tosyl. Uh, cyclohexane. That's my guess. Anyway, um, we're in DMF, uh, aprotic solvent, and the attacking species is uh, whatever that thing is. Let's see, trimethyl. Carbanion. I'll go with that. Okay, so uh, cross out reactions that cannot be ruled out. Well, we have um, the leaving group, of course, is a very good leaving group. And that carbon is sp3 hybridized. The attacking group is um, okay in DMF. Um, so we can eliminate the SN1 and the E1 reactions. Now, why would we want to do that? Because you got an excellent leaving group there. Let's see. Uh, we see that the leaving group is suitable, attached to sp3 carbon, tertiary butoxide anion will serve as the attacking species. Well, there it is, tertiary butoxide. So, uh, we've met the conditions for step one. Step two, we rule out SN1E2 because the solvent is aprotic. Ah, leaving just SN. Okay, so aprotic solvents um, do not stabilize the carbocation. All right, so SN1 and E1 are eliminated. Well, we set those aside. Okay, that was like before. Okay, I missed that one. A, a protic solvent will stabilize a carbocation by solvation. Okay, uh, so that's step two. Step three, I got another slide for step three. Here we go. We identify the um, tertiary uh, butoxide as a strong nucleophile because it has a full negative charge and a strong base because it's stronger than hydroxide. Yeah, because the acid is weaker. The attacking species therefore favors both SN2 and E2, so we're still left with those two reactants. All right, how about uh, step four? Our goal is to break the tie between SN2 and E2. The attacking species is a strong, bulky base. So SN2 would be discouraged. It can't get in there and attack that carbon. 
Yeah, E2 would be the winner. Uh, now, um, we want to say something about the, the major product. Uh, since the attacking species, now since it's an E2, the attacking species is going to attack a hydrogen. Now, there are two beta hydrogens, one on one side and one on the other. <clears throat> the one on the right-hand side is um, uh, equatorial. It's in the same plane as the tosylate. And we know that the, uh, the preferred attack is on the hydrogen that's anti to the tosylate. So that would be on, in our orientation, that would be the one on the left. So it attacks that hydrogen and forms the double bond between the, the left-hand carbon, two carbons. That's the major product. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do the other side, but the major product is going to be um, the one shown. This is uh, referred to as stereospecific because it's of its anti-coplanar uh, conformation. For the substrate. It says only gives rise to that one. I, I think there's there'll probably be some minor amount of the other one. Okay, how about this one? Draw the complete mechanism and predict the products for the reaction shown here. In this reaction, R bromomethyl D1. D1, that's deuterium instead of hydrogen, it's deuterium. Benzene is dissolved in methanol. Sometimes they do that. Um, they tag a molecule with some deuterium, so they so they create a chiral center, and they can uh, track the reaction better. See what the mechanisms are. Okay, is there a suitable leaving group uh, on the sp three hybridized carbon? Yep, there's a bromine. How about the attacking group? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I don't think it would favor um it would favor an SN2 reaction though. So the bromide leaving group is suitable, uh attached to SP3. Uh attacking species is methanol, which is also a solvent, therefore we uh, we do expect all of them to be possible and competing. Substrate is primary, which normally would lead to an excessively un unstable carbocation and rule out SN1 or E1. So let's go back. Yes, substrate is primary. Okay. So um, the SN1 and E1 would be ruled out because the carbocation would be very unstable. But the substrate is benzylic. Resulting carbocation is stabilized. So we, we oh, I was going to rule it out. They're not letting me <laughs> out there reactions. There are no beta hydrogens, however, so we rule out E2 and E1. There are no beta hydrogens. Oh, that's right. There's no beta hydrogen on here, right? That's the alpha right there. And there's the beta right there. There are no hydrogens. Right, because that carbon has four bonds to it. There's no hydrogen there. Right, so we can't do uh, an E two or an E E one reaction. So that leaves S N one. That's all that's left. S N one is the only possibility. So that means we're going to get a um, uh, a heterolysis. The bromine's going to leave. Leaves behind a secondary carbocation in methanol which is stabilized and then the methanol is going to attack that carbon and then uh, another methanol is going to uh, proton transfer and that leaves behind an ether and because we went from a carbocation we have a mixture a racemic mixture of both R and S because you can attack from either side on that carbon. That carbon is still chiral. 
So that means uh, when it was uh, trigonal planar, right, as a carbocation, we get attacked from either side. So we get a mixture of R and S. So what's regioselectivity? I had to look it up. I couldn't remember. Regioselectivity. Um, in an elimination reaction, well, actually, regioselectivity doesn't have to be elimination reaction. It's the preference of a reaction to take place at one site within a molecule over another. So in other words, uh, if you have, say, two or three carbons possible for an attack, there's only one preferred. That's regioselective. All right. In this case, we have a <clears throat> two-iodohexane that's in methanol at elevated temperature, which is a clue. <laughs> it's probably an E-type reaction. And our attacking species is this um, methoxy group. Uh, and we get two possibilities. The major um, product is this hex-2-ene versus the hex-1-ene. That's largely based upon the formation of the carbocation. Which carbocation is more stable? A secondary versus a primary. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's see, 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 see. I thought it was going to. No, I guess it didn't. I thought it was going to show us. So this is known as the Zaitsev rule. When the when you have a leaving group on uh, a carbon, the product that's formed is the one that has the fewer number of hydrogens attached to the carbons in the double bond. The more highly substituted alkene product is more stable. What they mean by that is um, when you substitute, you're substituting something for hydrogens. So in the in the uh, hex one ene you've got two hydrogens on that first carbon, and in the um, hex two ene the substitution has there are more carbons attached to and fewer hydrogens attached to the carbons in the double bond. All right, increasing stability of the double bond. The most stable double bond is tetrasubstituted. In other words, you've got carbons attached to on all sides of the double bond. <clears throat> Tri-substituted, you've got another hydrogen in there. Uh, Di-substituted uh, puts two hydrogens in there, and the more stable puts two hydrogens on one of the carbons rather than trans or cis. Cis is the least stable, uh, I think, because those two R groups up here getting in each other's way. <clears throat> trans is more stable because the R groups are further apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm not sure why the di substituted like this one is more stable. Let's see. Those R groups... Beats me. I understand trans and cis, but I'm not too sure about the uh, the di substituted where both R groups are on the same carbon. And then the mono substituted is the least stable for all the double bonds. Okay, steric hindrance, that makes sense. Cis is less stable than trans. Okay. Uh, the major elimination product, the Zaitsev rule, the major elimination product is the one produced by deprotonating the carbon atom initially attached to the fewest hydrogen atoms. That simply says that the carbocation is um, 
the more stable one. I like it. I, I like it that way. It makes more sense. So in this case, the uh, one in is a minor product and the two in is a major product. So you could form a double bond on the left-hand side or you could form a double bond on the right-hand side of that carbon attached to the leaving group. Um, and the uh, the more substituted one is the 2E. That's the Zaitsev rule. There are exceptions, of course. <laughs> Anti-Zaitsev. Um, with a strong, bulky base. If the base comes in and tries to, to remove a hydrogen, it's going to have an easier job removing a hydrogen from um, a less substituted carbon. So it's going to attack the end. And, and that will produce the, the one E versus the two E. So that way you can be selective about which one you want. Say, I don't want a two E. I want more one E. So use a bulky base instead. and get your anti Uh I never did understand hyperconjugation much. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just <laughs> get it. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. If you don't get it, I'm not gonna get it. Yeah. Intermolecular reactions versus intramolecular cyclizations. Uh, intermolecular is uh, reactions between two separate molecules. Or if you have um, two of the same molecule and they react, one um, reaction site reacts with the other reaction site, um, then you get an intra intermolecular reaction. But if you have two reaction sites on, say, the ends of the molecules, they can flip around and react with one another and make a ring. That's an intramolecular reaction. Now, there are conditions under which intramolecular is, is uh, preferred over intermolecular. Here's an example of an intramolecular where you have a, uh, uh, a nucleophile on one end of the molecule and one, two, three, four, five, five carbons in between. So we're going to form a bond between that oxygen and the carbon attached to the chloride. One end of the molecule is nucleophile and it attacks the other end of the molecule um, and forms the tetrahydroparan. Okay, that's an intramolecular. Um, the intramolecular reaction typically wins out over its competing intermolecular reaction when the formation of a five or six membered ring is possible. Right. So in this case, the intramolecular would be favored over the intermolecular because you form a six membered ring. Um, if you get the two molecules side by side and then the um, nucleophile from one attacks the um, carbon of the leaving group on the other, then you get a different molecule, you get an ether. <clears throat> so for a ring to form, two ends of the chain have to form a new bond, which reduces their freedom of movement. That decreases their entropy. which means that it's unfavorable according to entropy. But the opposing factor is uh, ring strain. You tend to reach an optimum of ring strain with five and six membered rings. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. We could go deeper, but I, I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, we've got a whole bunch of slides here at the end on monosaccharides, uh, glycosides, and I think this is this is going into too much depth. I mean, if you if you eventually go to uh, biochemistry, you're going to get all of this. So um, I think this is probably too much sugar for a dime. You do get uh, this, uh, here's the straight chain form, this um, um, 
Yeah, what's the projection for this one? All I can think of is Newman, Haworth, and oh shoot. I hate it when that happens. Anyway, you remember studying these, mm -hmm. but uh but the uh, the one tail of this um oxygen can attack that carbon or this oxygen can attack that carbon and we dehydrate it and form the ring and get the most stable of course is still the chair conformation and uh, then we can react with uh, this beta D glucose we can react with methanol and hydrochloric acid under acidic conditions and and add a uh, methoxy group to it the acetylcarbon. This is known as, let's see, when you have this oxygen attached to a carbon and a hydroxyl here, I think this is a hemiacetal. That's neither here nor there for you, I guess. But there are, there are preferred outcomes. Uh, there's more, there's more, there's more. Uh, there's a difference between um, animal starches, uh, starch, and cellulose. And it has to do with that um, glycosidic linkage here between the glucose molecules, the beta versus the alpha. The alpha linkage puts the, the oxygen um, that's part of the linkage uh, opposite to the uh, let's see in an axial position whereas the alpha linkage uh, let's see this flips over the alpha linkage no that's not right the alpha linkage is opposite and the beta linkage is in the same is equatorial plane. Okay, the beta linkage is equatorial. The the long and the short is for all starches, we have enzyme systems that can break those apart. We can get at the glucose molecules for energy source. But cellulose with the beta linkage, our enzyme systems cannot access it. That's why even termites can't do it. They have the microorganisms in their guts that produce the enzymes that can digest cellulose. It's all because of that glycosidic linkage. Beta for cellulose versus alpha for the starches. Uh, that's the takeaway from this thing. All right.